soy Laura Ojea, periodista. Mi nombre es Laura Ojea, soy una journalista que se especializa en energía en español. Y vamos a hablar sobre la economía de carbonización de carbonización y la energía de transición en la EU. Uno de los diferentes reuniones durante este ciclo que estamos teniendo, los desafíos post-COVID y los desafíos something that has been sponsored by the GEF with the collaboration with, of La Casa Encendida and of the Foundation Transición Verde. There is a simultaneous translation for those of you who do not speak Spanish so that you can listen to the English version by, by clicking on an icon, which is the globe, and there's a word um, interpretation on top of it, so you can always click on that. So you can listen to this um, debate both in English and in Spanish. And I would like to benefit from this occasion because this coincides in time with news that could have an important impact on everything that has to do with energy and all the decisions that have to do with energy that have been made in, in Europe. On October 7th, the European Parliament uh, passed a new decision and the CO2 emissions needed to be even more ambitious. So. The percentage that had been approved a year before is now being set at 60%. We only need for the meeting of the European Council that will take place today and tomorrow allows us to reach a real commitment. And during that meeting, we will discuss the, um, this reduction of CO2 that the Commission, European Com Commission wants. Um, the Parliament wants 60% and we see that there is resistance by some of the members. But why is it important to have this reduction of CO2 that we are emitting to the atmosphere up to 60%? Well, because scientists say and that we are not making the right decisions and we're not doing it at the right pace in order to avoid an irreversible climate change. And the risk of these changes that come down in a cascade is greater than what we expected. Two decades ago, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, warned us of the fact that there are non-return points, critical points that could be devastating, such as the destruction of the Amazonian jungle and the loss of ice in Groenland. And that is already happening. The EU is the leader in a change of energy policies and strategy that has an impact on our daily and our day to day to stop what seems unstoppable. And they're working on a roadmap with very specific milestones for the reduction of CO2, but also with the use of renewable energies and um, energy efficiency. It seems that in Europe the change is already taking place. We could say that renewables um, are now dominating the new installed capacities in Europe and last year they were even greater than fossil fuels um, as the main source for the production of energy in Europe for the first time in history. 37.5% of electricity production in our continent came from renewable energies and 34.3% were fossil fuels and 28% was nuclear, nuclear energy, but it's not enough. Now, with the pandemic um, following up closely, we need that change. And Ursula von der Leyen presented her Green Deal. Well, the Green Deal for all Europeans, this Green Pact. She presented some objectives and she wanted to promote efficiency, energy, energy, energy take efficiency, and they needed a new um, policy that is based on circular economy and a um, way of building that is more efficient, that is more responsible. So these are big words for, that bring hope so that we can reduce our emissions even up to 90% in 2050. That is what we're looking for. That's the objective we're looking for, a zero emission horizon. And COVID, well, we, has happened, and now we're talking even more about green reconstruction. And the EU wants to mobilize a billion euros in a decade to promote this transition towards a green economy, a low carbon economy. And that is why we have an emergency fund that has been approved that has 750 million euros uh, that will follow that roadmap, but with a very clear idea, it needs to be a green future, a digital future that will resist when faced to climate change. But I am not the person who can best explain what are the steps that we need to take from now onwards if we want to have 
a society or a future that is more sustainable and that is actually possible. Those who can really explain that to us are the experts that we have invited here today who are around this digital um, round table. And we will be talking about decarbonization, if possible, and that energetic transition, energy transition. So we have Marie Toussaint, Marie Toussaint, who is a legal expert, French legal expert, and she is a Euro MP. She is a Green MP, and she is a member of the Industry Committee, Research and Energy Committee. And we also have Pedro Prieto, Pedro Prieto with us. He is the Vice President of AIDEN, the Association for the Study of Energy Resources who has been a consultant in development, construction, and operations for many different PV projects, and he is a counselor with regard, he is a consultant with regards to energy in general. And he will be talking about his book, most probably, because it is uh, the center of his discourse. And finally, Giorgio Scalis, who is a, a professor at CREA, the research institution in Catalonia, and he's also a member of ERITSA from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, where he researches on ecological economy. But I don't want to take any more of your time. They will all have some minutes to share with us their position with regards to this question, whether it is possible to reach that decarbonization. And we will start with Georgios, who is going to open up this debate. So Georgios, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. I, I am going to start this debate in a way that might be a bit more general, and then we will zoom in into the uh, topic at hand. So my role is to develop the idea or this vision that is a bit, a bit more general about what we call degrowth. What do we mean by degrowth? What does it mean? And I'm only going to touch upon how relevant this is, what we're mentioning here today, which is decarbonization. I believe that Pedro is going to dig deeper into uh, the energy system that we need and, and why we need this new system for degrowth. But in order to center the debate, I'm going to really uh, leave it at a philosophical and social level, although I'm not a philosopher. I started my career after university working at the European Parliament, so I started with politics and, and then I started taking steps backwards because I wanted to understand where all of this comes from and how we can think about these things, about these problems, these issues in a deeper way. And we need to get away from what's immediate and what's political so that we can see it. So what do we mean by degrowth? We do not mean, obviously, that that we need a recession and we're not uh, the champions of a collapse of economy. We are not calling for what is happening currently with all the lockdowns and the, the chaos of an economy that we we can not, no longer manage if there isn't constantly an expansion of the set econ economies. What we want to say with degrowth, maybe the word is not the perfect word, but it's really a call for action in the society that needs to have a culture and institutions that set limits. The key word here is limits. We have to self-limit ourselves. We need to have a society that limits itself, that gets rid of this constant this constant game of, of expanding, constant expansion, constant colonization, constant, constant growth. So the idea of degrowth is, is this, this idea that we can live well within limits, uh, planetary limits, but also personal limits and collective limits as well. Because without limits, it's not just that we are destroying what's outside, but without limits, we can't... Uh, live in, in freedom. There is no freedom without limits. And that is the main argument of a book that I published last year called Limits. It's going to be translated into Spanish and Catalan next year. 
in with the publishing house Arcadia from Barcelona. And the that was the main argument of my book that the problem the problem we face with climate change is not about what policies are we going to implement or what energy systems we're going to put in place, but rather this is a cultural program. We have lost the capacity as a society of thinking that we could live with limits. And we need to understand that the real freedom is not uh, being able to overcome those limits, but rather understanding and accepting those limits and living within those limits. And in the book, I have an image that could really capture this idea better than my theory, uh, theoretical words, this idea of freedom within limits. It is the idea of a, pi uh, of a pianist. In order to play a piano, they need a piano, which is a limited... Uh, instrument. If you give a pianist um, a piano that is endless, they cannot play something that's interesting, they cannot function, they can, it's a co complete collapse. And this anthropological idea, a cultural idea that our society has of, of wanting the illimited is in the base, in the basis of this um, unending growth is the main cultural problem that we live nowadays. And those of us who speak about degrowth are calling for the re-establishment of a culture and institutions of limits, of sufficiency, of living with what we have and to be satisfied with what we have. There's always been people who went against their times and against the prevalence of, of, of the society, modern society. There's always been people who fought for this idea of limits, of living within limits. We can even go before the modern ages and talk about the old days and talk about philosophy and the institutions of the old Greece. I'm, a, I'm, I'm Greek, so that is why I talk about, about Greece. But I think that in that sense, Greeks, and the more you go to the East, the, the better you understand limits. And the old Greeks were a civilization, a society that was based on the idea of limits. They were institutionalized in that idea of limits, but also during during modern times, the romantics also and the anarchists of the beginning of the century and feminists such as Goldman and the environmental movement of the 70s in their more radical way, which unfortunately has been lost in the 80s and the 90s, the environmental movement was a movement and these were groups of people who who asked for limits. They asked for us to understand that we can live well between limits and they put it on the table and they defended that idea. It was a proposal for a good life. It was not just about saying that the world is going to be destroyed and we're destroying the world and we need to limit ourselves. No, they were really, they were really saying that the life that makes sense is that which has limits. And that's the idea of the radical environmental movement that has such a long history that we are asking to defend as a community, as intellectuals and activists that defend degrowth. Degrowth means that we put a limit to growth, to this never-ending growth, which is a crazy idea, such a crazy idea as the old gods that all civilizations believed in. And the idea that economy can grow 3% every year and it can be 12 times bigger at the end of this century and that it can be endless in size in two, three centuries is an idea that is clearly crazy. But that is an idea that our society is based on. Without growth, we find collapse. So those of us who talk about degrowth want to escape this craziness of the limitless idea that brings us to chaos and start thinking about how we can organize and institutionalize a society that is based in limits. In the new book that I published with my colleagues Susan, Federico de Maria, and Simona Lisa last year, which is called The Case for Degrowth, it is... Uh, it's what degrowth defends. We were trying to set in a concrete way this idea. What do we mean by a degrowth society? How is it built? And we did not just start with the big policies and the big changes where we need to set limits, but rather we focused on what is happening now. 
We already have in our territory, we have people who are organizing themselves in a different way. What are the cultures that we have that are producing something different and that are defending it right now? And we mainly focused on what is called the economy of common good or solidary or social economy, the infrastructure that it has and the culture that it already has. Although it's small, it's a minority culture, it, it, it gives us a different imagination, an, ima uh, an image of sufficiency of limits. And based on this in social infrastructure that we already have, we ask ourselves in the book how this can be um, can be amplified and how can we organize it politically so that their ideas and their way of living, the way they have decided to live are generalized, are not just maintained as something that only a minority does, so that it, it is not seen as another culture, so that this culture can be mainstream and the prevailing culture. And we talk about political strategies that can be set up, but we also talk about some concrete policies that uh, political parties nowadays who are, under, who are being mobilized by these collectives, by these people who are using it on our day to day, we can open the new spaces so that we can live well without growth. And this is not theoretical, this is very specific. The key, this is the key word of the current phase we live in. How can we have an economy in a society that works and that is not collapsed when there is a need such as the one that we currently have with, pandem with a pandemic such as we have it right now? How can we redistribute resources from the superfluous, the non-necessary to the necessary and to keep on working? We have proposals in our book about uh, carbon rates, about what we call Green New Deal, but in a very different way, without needing to, to think about constant growth. We have ideas of how to support solidary economy, which is essential, the reduction of working hours. And another institution that we believe is fundamental is, is having a universal... Um, salary for the care society because that's the most important work that we are all doing and even more so during these difficult times. Now, with regards to energy, and I will end in a couple minutes because I think that Pedro is going to complement my, my speech quite well. With regards to energy, what, what, what we need, and I'm talking about a general idea, but what we still need um, at the EU, at the political level, is that we don't have any references to the idea of sufficiency or limits or the idea of consumption and demand of energy. I mean, it's very good to, to set up resources and spend money in investing for the decarbonization. I think it is key that the energy that we produce in the next 20, 30 years is renewable. Without that, we will never advance. It cannot just be about reducing consumption if we keep on using um, carbon energies. But what I do think that what is basic and, and still it's something that hasn't been touched upon and we need to fight so, so that this is present is the idea of sufficiency. How much energy does the EU need? How much energy do we need to live well? And how much can we reduce our energy consumption, the one that we currently have? And I'm not just talking about efficiency measures, I'm also talking about sufficiency measures. How many activities can we stop that are superfluous, that are not needed, and how much production do they consume? How much can we reduce our consumption so that we can save phenomenal amounts of energy? So so that we can reach that level that we want for 2050. And the rest of the work can be done with investment in renewable energies. That's what I believe. Yes, yes, could, you, could we please start finishing? I'm in my 12 minutes, but yes. And, and to finish, with a more quantitative aspect, I would say that all the aspects that we're working on Right now, um, we're talking about scenarios of uh, energy transition after, after this period until 2050. We don't see any uh, feasible scenario where we could be between 1.5 or 2 degrees of a global, global warmth, which is the objective of the EU after the um, Paris 
Paris um, deal. And they all require a drastic reduction of energy. And I think that that has to do with economic activity. The only way for the IPCC scenarios or the EU scenarios could work so that we are within those temperatures is imagining technologies that are going to be absorbing um, carbon in the future, but that doesn't exist, and it's not, and it's not. Maybe it will never exist. So the key question is: Can we reduce two, three percent our energy use on a yearly basis, and how? Okay, thank you very much, Georgios. I just wanted to remind all of you who are following up on this debate: you can ask your questions by using the chat. I'm sure that our experts will be happy to answer to your questions. And we will now give the floor to Pedro Prieto, who um, has been mentioned during the previous presentation, so he will now share with us his vision. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for your presentation. It was a very kind presentation, and I would like to thank the organizers, the Green European Foundation, Transición Verde, and La Casa Entendida, for their collaboration. I have been... Uh, hello? Uh, hello? Hello? Yes. 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 We can hear you. We can hear you. Don't worry, Pedro. Okay. So I was I was happily surprised with uh, Giorgio's um, introduction because usually you expect economic information from an economist, but he has actually been philosophical and social. But he has also talked about economy and talking about deep growth is being very courageous, very brave in this economic system that we're in. So I would try to think of, uh, I would like to tackle this quite briefly. It will not take me more than 10 minutes. And what I did want to do, I don't know if you'll allow me to show you a slide. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I could try and show you the slide so that you can see. Let's see if I can do this. And if I can't, then I will start talking. Let's see. No, I can't. This is not the one. Can you see something? No, we only see you, no, no, so you don't see. Oh, I haven't hit on the button share, so I think I'm going to. I'm going to try. Yes, I'm going to try it. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to show it here. Let's see if I can share it. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Okay, so if you take a look at this, what we usually see in this world is that we talk a lot about uh, what the problem is, what's the problem, the, the sea is going up, the desertification, polar bears are dying, there are forest fires, but this, this is the, the derivative. Then when we talk about the causes, then we talk about the fact that temperatures are increasing, there is, a cli there is a global warming, so if it is over two, it would be catastrophic. So then we think about the causes of why temperature is going up and why there is global warmth. That takes us to the first derivative, which is the CO2 emissions, which is the objective of this presentation. We have gone from 280 parts per million to 415 parts per million that are going on dramatically. And then we have an information black hole, which is uh, talking about what we've always talked and then. And then we just talk about renewable energies and we talk about it just as business as usual. So renewables, as we know them, just to maintain the world as we know it, uh, will, will save our life 100%. But then we forget about the last part, which is the fact that we have burned 11,500 million tons per year of fossil fuels. And I wanted to talk about that. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this other slide? Can you see the next slide? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, you can see it. Well, this is a Sankey's diagram from the International um, Energy Agency, and this is energy consumed in 2018. We are burning 14 uh, billion tons of fossil fuel. 86% are fossil fuels. And this will generate electricity here, which is a, a, a generation with 72.3%. I'm talking about the world, I'm not talking about Europe, because we talked about Europe and we said that in Europe there is a greater percentage of renewable energies in the generation of electricity. But worldwide, we are still around 72.3% with fossil fuels. And since the problem of, climate, of, of global warmth is something global, not just European, although our work is to start with Europe, our, that is where we stand. We have a problem. And then we 
have a whole um, series of energy systems where in the end, at the end, to your right, you have the industry that is burning 2,800 million tons, out of which 64% are fossil fuels, transportation, which is all fossil fuels, and then residential consumption, which represents around 1,400 million tons, and then we have non-energy uses, which are, for instance, plastics and the use of, uh, of oil and fossil fuels that are, not, um, that are not energy uses, and all of this to maintain the industry in general. And from there, I go to the next slide, which is how this is distributed, how the um, energy consumption is distributed the world over, and it is not well distributed. It is following the Pareto diagram, which is an unbalance, a very serious unbalance in the whole population. We have at the basis the uh, human population. We're talking about 770 million inhabitants. We have to the left the richest people in the planet who are consuming um, oil, gas, carbon, uranium, and renewable energies almost disappear in this diagram. And then we have, for instance, countries such as China that are, are very much uh, carbon ca carbon oriented, they consume less, but they're still there. And this unbalance shows that 70% of the population are consuming 30% of the energy, and the other 30% of the population is eating up 70% of the world production and the world um, energy consumption. And this should make us think, even us who, who believe are green, such as Norwegians and Finnish or Swedish, who are always saying that they're very green, but when the energy per capita is established, they're always at the higher end of world consumption, and many of them with a very high consumption of fossil fuels. So we are overcoming 60% the load capacity of the planet, according to William Rex, with whom I have a great friendship. And, and finally, if what we think is that we should all um, have the European level of life, this would be the situation. Right now, we would require to double the uh, energy consumption, so we're living in a world where the system is completely unsustainable. And I don't want to say what would happen if we were to live in the American, the American, the American way of life. We would have to double we would have to multiply by four our consumption capacity to maintain that level of life. And as George was saying, this is not sustainable, this cannot be sustained. So we have to find other methods, and not another methodology. And why? Well, because of all the methodologies we have this, the way in which we distribute resources makes us not even think about just the fact that we are a, a country that is going to uh, build lots of uh, renewable energies. We have to distribute better and we need to extract less. And Europe, what it generally does is is an economic entity, a very important economic entity in the world, together with the US, Japan, and China nowadays. But logically, we are extracting from the rest of the world, and then, and then we consume it. So all of this is a situation that we need to tackle and we need to analyze with much seriousness when we talk about decarbonizing. Because we, we are talking about decarbonizing, but for instance, if you look at this curve, the um, energy consumption is directly linked with GDP, with what we call economic activity. It is almost a straight line. If we want to increase our GDP, we're going to incre increase our energy consumption. We can do it in an ecological way. Well, yes, maybe these uh, straight line could be a bit more curved, as we see here with the green line at the higher part but there is a reality, there is a determination rate that is quite direct that shows that if we want to have economic activity as the one that we currently have, then we have to consume a lot of energy. And now focusing on Europe, in Europe this is something that the previous energy commissioner, Miguel Arias Cañete, had, um, had proposed. He said that we needed to reduce our CO2 emissions down to zero in 2050, but he said by maintaining a sustained growth of 2% um, per year of our GDP. So we would be here in this vertical line. And we are, uh, Europe was going down, that, that was the red line with regards to energy consumption and our GDP kept on going up. So what Arias Cañete proposed here, what he intended, what our European Commissioner 
intended in this action for climate and for energy was to keep on having the GDP grow up till 2050 and uh, have a degrowth in, in energy consumption. But that is uh, almost impossible because what Europe is doing is send emissions and extractions outside of Europe. But then if you go to the world and you look at this diagram, you see that if the GDP goes up in the world is because the energy consumption is going up and the emissions are also going up, which is the CO2, that's the red line. So how the hell are we going to manage to have emissions go down to zero while we still see GDP grow um, in a definite way? So I agree with Georgios in that point, and I don't want to take more of your time because I'm sure that we will have time to talk about these topics with all of the participants and with the rest of the speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro. And it's true, because we have lots of questions asked by the participants, but we are going to wait for Marie's uh, presentation. She said that she is going to try and do her presentation in Spanish. So she will tell us from her point of view how she sees the decarbonization of the economy. So go ahead, Marie. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for your interventions. I'm going to try and do it in Spanish and if it is a catastrophe, then just let me know. Well, we have a translator in case you, you want to switch into, into English. So, in order to begin, I would like to say that I, I really liked listening um, that talk about limits to the planet and justice as well, because I think that these are topics that are at the center, at the core of what we need to do nowadays. So we're going to talk a bit about the, about the topic of energy and climate in the EU. But I also want to open up the debate so that we can, so that I can answer to what was said before my intervention. I also wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Laura because she did, she painted a very complete landscape of the situation, of the political situation here in Europe. I could not have done it better than she did. So. That is the beginning of this debate. So what we have said up till now was that Europe is is not completely on the right way for for neutral um, for climate neutrality. We're all talking about climate neutrality for 2050, but the objectives that have been set in the law currently do not allow for us to reach uh, that that neutrality. We only can reach 60%. Um, reduction of emissions, CO2 emissions and, and, other, um, and other emissions, other gases. So, and, and that's without talking about the imported emissions with the delocalized emissions, because for instance, in France, we have we currently produce more CO2 and other gases than in 1990 because we are delocalizing or importing emissions. So those are the emissions that we do not produce in our territories, but that we have sent outside and that is not the object of any trajectory or any strategy. So if we talk about the emissions that we that we see within our countries with the current laws, we would reach only a 60% reduction of our emissions by 2050. So it would not be climate neutral. So we have to increase this. We need to have better objectives. And where are we? Well, right now, the Commission is talking about 
as an objective for 2030. The next uh, 10 years are the years where we can really act, and if we do not act during the next 10 years, then it will be the end. So, we have to act, but the Commission is talking about 55, and it's still less than that. It's around 50 percent because they're including in their calculations trees and other sources of uh, of uh, carbon capture that are correct in figures. So it's not really 55 percent. But the Commission is talking about that. And last week, the European Parliament voted for the for reaching the objective of 60 percent. 60 percent if we listen to scientists, would allow us to reach up to 1.9 degrees of, uh, of global warm, uh, warming. So, so even the 60 percent uh, objective for 2030 would not even guarantee the objectives that were agreed upon in Paris. Is my Spanish good enough? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Then I'll continue. Yes, we can follow up on, or we can follow you. We can follow along. So, and what many scenarios show is that it is possible to reach climate neutrality in 2040 we don't need to wait until 2050, it could be possible by 2040. And, and we could, we could reach a higher percentage than what has been put on the table right now. And what we know from Denmark, Finland and Sweden is that nowadays in the European Council, they are giving their support to an objective of at least 60 percent so they're ready to go beyond 60 percent but obviously there are countries that are blocking that have always been blocking these political objectives when i was talking about the different scenarios i was talking about the scenarios that think tanks and uh, Ecological associations are considering, such as Megawatt, that are still talking about climate neutrality without uh, nuclear energy. But there are also lobbies, nuclear lobbies, such as ENI or, or NG. These are companies that uh, favor fossil fuels who say that it is possible to reach climate neutrality in 2040. Okay, so we also have good news. So let's continue with that figure that is being defended at the European Parliament, 60%, which is something. But we've also managed to ask for the creation of a high council, a high council for climate, for climate as we have it in France, with independent scientists who can say whether we're following the right track or not, and that is very important. And also, we have made progress because we asked for a carbon budget, and the idea is for, for us to look every five years at the situation and what we want to do with this carbon budget to decide whether we go beyond or if we are still lagging behind. And we also have made progress with regards to uh, different sectors of the economy and their trajectory. That is good. And we have to fight against well, actually, right now, companies are protecting their investments. How do you say that? Inversiones. Inver <laughs> they're telling her how to say it in Spanish. So, so companies are protecting their investments even in fossil fuel in fo fossil fuels, and the EU and member states can't do anything in that sense. So, what we asked for was for states and the EU to be protected against those or from those companies that want to uh, protect their investments. So the thing is that we don't have the right objectives 
los objetivos que en verdad necesitan. The objectives that we really would need in order to protect the climate. And, and it's the same thing with all the Green Deal uh, laws. When you look at the Green Deal, in, when, you, when, when you look at the Green Deal uh, for the 1930s, it was a new contract between the economy and the society, and what the European Commission is not proposing a new deal. It's not a new contract. There is no discussion about the reform of the financing or the reform of subsidies to fossil fuels or the creation of uh, or the recognition of the rights of uh, the environment. There's nothing in, in there about that. What we have is a series of legislations that need to be changed with better uh, environmental objectives, but we still don't have what we need. But, well, it's, it's better than living in the U.S. or in China or India or in Brazil. So, so we're fighting so that things can be better. And I have one example, an example that I want to share with you. And then I will talk a bit about degrowth so that we can open the debate and then I'll stop. But it's a, an example, which is gas. We have to fight against gas, gas called natural gas, but it is a fossil fuel. It is a fossil energy and we have to fight against it because all lobbies are here, really uh, rooting for gas. And in all the uh, budgets that are proposed for the European Commission or the European Parliament, they say that this is a transition energy. And it's not an energy transition, it is an energy that is killing us. And the thing is that nowadays we are deciding about investments that are going to last 30, 40 years. Um, for instance, infrastructures, and we still don't know when the public subsidies will end for those infrastructures for fossil fuels. We are really fighting a lot, but it is estimated that we will have to invest at least 100 billion, I'm sorry, 100 billion euros, and lots of those millions are public money in those infrastructure projects in the next two years. If that's all right with you, could you please finish so that we can start with the questions because we have lots of questions. I'm really sorry because since it's in Spanish, I, it's a bit harder for me. No, 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 that's great. It's just so that we um, don't go over the time. But if you want, I can give you more examples about the gas and the problems that we have and we have to face lobbies because lobbies are deciding where our money is being invested and that is, um, that is something that is really bad when we talk about hydrogen and when we talk about the need to have a green hydrogen one of the main worries that we have is that uh, that it will be the hydrogen lobbyists who will decide again how we're going to spend our money and where we're going to invest um, our money so in the end I wanted to say that there is a conversation about degrowth and it, and it maybe it, it gives you a bad idea or you can imagine something that is wrong. But if we talk about the limits of the planet, then maybe that gives you a better idea of what, I, of what we're talking about. But the way in which I see economy, it's an economy of the rights of nature. I already talked about the rights of nature from a legal point of view as well. Okay? So we have to give a legal statute to ecosystems, but if we see it applied to economy, what we have to do is develop and imagine an economy that is adapting itself to the pace of nature. So we mustn't plan it all because when we think that we have a solution and we develop it all over the place, it's always a problem. But if we adapt ourselves, if we always adapt to the needs of, of nature, 
desarrolla una otra then we will develop another way another kind of economy that is good for the planet and good for human beings and I'll leave it at that okay thank you thank you so much uh, Marie I, I've actually been reading some questions that are very good. For instance, Marta Martinez was asking, I think it was a question for Georgios. I, I think that Georgios could maybe answer how to, to tell countries or institutions that degrowth is a theory that needs to be done when the growth and when the growth and uh, Economic growth is about uh, GDP growing. Marie has also talked about this, but maybe Georgios could complete this. How can we make them understand that that is the way? Well, I think that what's important is to have more people being aware of the idea that growth, constant growth nowadays is a false objective, is an idea that takes us to, to collective suicide. If we have people who are aware of the fact that that is true and then um, governments are not aliens from other country, from other planets who are um, high up above and don't know what we're thinking. If it is a common thinking, if many people share this vision, then the governments that we choose will have to react. And I think that we are entering at a very different phase, a different era, different to the 90s or to the beginning of the 2000s. The economy right now is collapsing and it's collapsing because it's reaching its, le its limits, not just its environmental um, limits, but also social and economic limits. Uh, limits. We cannot exploit more and more people to produce more and more revenue for the economy to grow. So nowadays, the current system has found its limits and it cannot keep on going without um, us exploiting people or the nature. So, so we have to think about alternatives. I think that there are people who will listen. I'm not going to insist on degrowth, but, but I think that there are many things that are linked to degrowth and many of the proposals that we currently have and that we are sending to local and national uh, governments are proposals that can be debated. They're radical, yes, they're radical, but they can be debated. For instance, one one universal salary uh, for caretakers. We can debate this. I know it is quite radical, but it is also something that is reasonable. Okay, following this idea, Laura Talen said that we are not analyzing the limits with regards to uh, material resources for renewable energies. And I think that this is also interesting in this ecological transition or energy transition. Georgios, for instance, tell us, how would you see this? How would you see this, this topic? Well, it's actually very important, this, because it's true that um, our transition towards renewable energies, which is what, what, what we all hope for, what we hope would happen, and as Marie explained, it's very important, it's very difficult, but if we were to manage this transition, if, if we go um, up to the level of consumption that we currently have, and if we keep on growing at the rates that we are growing, we would be talking about a demand of materials that would, be, that would come from parts of the world that are already exploited, and it would be... Um, enormous, so we wouldn't be able to do it. So, so what can we do? Well, how can we put limits? We can set limits. I think that the, we can set limits as we have always set limits with legislation and with rates. So these are political instruments, quotas and, and legislation. This is effective, I think, that for the limit of the use of resources, but it is very difficult from a political standpoint because there's always a position and there's always a position because obviously this clashes against the immediate revenue and 
immediate wealth creation. So we have to set limits to resources. For instance, how much, how many resources can the Spanish economy use, or how can, how much can be exported from Africa or Latin America? Can we institutionalize this? Can we uh, legislate? Can we set limits for carbon materials so that, so that we can limit them? Well, that's interesting. Pedro, Juan Arias from COPE Radio said that the um, International Energy Agency has just published this 2020 outlook, which was quite surprising due to the conclusions that they, that they draw from it. Could you tell us what you think about this? In, uh, briefly, briefly, okay, briefly. I think that the best conclusion has already been uh, offered by Antonio Turiel on his blog, uh, Oil Crash, because I think it is a great summary of what happens. If I were to summarize this, I would say that it's weak. It's the first time that a report that uh, usually is 700 pages long has only been 400 pages long and has turned the International Agency of Energy into an international uh, weather um, agency or medicine um, agency because they talk about COVID and of the scenarios that they consider for 2040. Two of them have to do with COVID and the other two scenarios have to do with sustainable growth. And, and the energy agency still thinks about sustainable growth and there is no sustainable growth in a finite world. Al Bartlett already said it, a professor from the University of Colorado. The main incapacity of human beings is understanding the, these functions. There is a problem with growth as George just said, and that is the problem. So I would, I would simply, to give you a, an idea of order of magnitude, I don't know if I could just show you one slide. Can you see the slide now? No, no, we, we cannot see it. Okay, I'm going to share it. Can you see him now? Okay, so to your left, you see what the World Energy Outlook says. And what they wish to do, or what they think they will do with solar energy, which is here, and wind energy until 2040. And also with other low carbon energies. And what they expect to do with oil and with carbon, I'm sorry, with, car with coal and gas. So um, oil even more, because if we analyze oil for 2040, they think that we, if there aren't any other investments, because there are no investments, we could have a scenario of going from 100 million barrels a day to 20 million barrels uh, a day. So this shows what this represents. And the objectives of the International Energy Agency, which is an international body where all the countries are represented because, because it's mainly OECD countries, so rich countries, they call it the watchdog of rich OECD countries. What they are considering as renewable energies is here for 2040. And what they are thinking will degrow due to the peak oil demand so that we have lost our energy appetite after 160 years growing economically in energy consumption. Now they say that there is no problem with energy, but it's just because we have lost our appetite and we're going to consume less on a yearly basis, but they don't know how. So this is oil, this is carbon, this is coal, and this is gas. Obviously, it, it is not going to come uh, be a good compensation, and we're talking about uh, 164 million terabytes per year, so 40,000 terabytes more, but they're going down. But the rest, how would you modify it with renewable energies? They have an, an important problem of contradiction. There is a contradiction in the um, international energy agency. That's how I can summarize it. Okay, so it's quite... Interesting. If you want, we could talk about this, those forecasts later on. But before, I wanted to give the floor uh, to Pepe Larios. Well, actually, a question that Pepe Larios asked for Marie, because the EU is thinking of lots of investments for green nitrogen and, and, and electrical cars. Do you think that this is feasible, or do you think that it's just uh, wasting energy and money? It's a very good question, a very good question, because there is a problem here. If I get, um, if I don't get it wrong, um, green hydrogen, they don't say green hydrogen, it's just hydrogen, and they're talking about lots of different colors, gray, blue, and green, and well, and brown, yes, true. I think that we're going to avoid 
the hydrogen of fossil fuels. Um, that's the one that comes from gas, from natural gas, as I said previously. But we will have this hydrogen that comes from gas, and we will have hydrogen that that comes from nuclear energy as well, especially in France. And we will have some green hydrogen. So what we need, we are not going to manage having, uh, manage reaching all of our climate objectives if we don't have green hydrogen. But what we're missing out on is a strategy, a sobriety energy strategy. We don't have any plan for 2020, for 2040, for 2050. We have nothing uh, drafted by the Commission that would set the line or the path to energy sobriety. I mean, they say it, but they don't do it. And with cars, it's a bit um, more of the same, really. It's still a dream. It's, yes, yes, a dream. So everyone is, is dreaming about this, about uh, driving with cars that are not polluting, that are not polluting. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for correcting my Spanish. But the truth is that we, we have a problem, which is the problem of, of mineral products, not mineral products, but products that are needed for those cars to be built. And those products come from China and other parts in the world, but they're finite as well. And we also have the problem of batteries that work with electricity. So in the end, it's just a dream. We think that everyone is going to have an electric car, but we cannot do it if we want to protect the environment. Our natural resources, it's just a, it's just a dream. And what we need to do is reduce in an ambitious way the number of cars, but we also need to take into account the social injustice. And one of the main problems we face is that those who have cars, those who have the oldest cars, but also many people who do not live just uh, in front of a train station are the ones who are poorer. And that is also a serious problem because before I met with you, I was uh, meeting with the intergroup of fight against poverty for the human rights in the European Parliament, and we were with people who live in extreme poverty, and they were saying that they are ashamed. They are ashamed. I'm sorry. They are ashamed of of being poor and not being able to act for the environment. And we have to, to avoid that. We need to fight against that because ecology cannot be a reason for um, dominating the poor. It cannot be something that dominates the poor. It, we need to fight for a healthy environment for everyone. Well, talking about degrowth and talking about finite uh, resources and mineral resources for the um, industry of electric cars, there is a concept that the EU has uh, passed or is clearly supporting, which is circular economy. I would like to know if any of you or all of you could, could tell me about the role of of what role could have this circular economy in this system of, uh, of degrowth. If I could start, I would say that circular economy does not exist. If we think of thermodynamics, it does not exist. We're talking about recycling lithium. Well, lithium can only be recycled up to 2%, and recycling 99% of lithium would require an immense amount of energy to take all batteries, all lithium batteries from mobiles and, and cars, because a car battery could weigh up to 500 kilos, and then take them to two or three centers, or 10 or 20 centers that could recycle those batteries. From an energy point of view, it is not possible. 
possible. No, no circular economy exists in that sense. What exists is uh, frugality. You need to be frugal in your consumption. And that megawatt that Marie was talking about, well, yes, the less we consume, the better. But circular economy, to think that we're going to keep on consuming and that we're going to recycle 100% of what we are, mm, that we are just vomiting on the world, does not exist. Georgios? Okay, let's see. I can be a bit more... Well, I also am quite critic with regards to circular economy, but I think that one of the ideas that are now being defended under this um, umbrella term of circular economy are some, some interesting, important ideas. We could say that they've always been there and they've always, um, ecologists have always defended them, they're not new, but the EU is now using these, this new fashion. Every five, ten years we, we talk about the same things with new words, but I think that the idea of regeneration, about focusing on the regeneration of ecosystems and the um, utility of the economy and recycle as much as we can. As, what, as Pedro was saying, it cannot be 100%. And, and in many cases, it cannot be over 40% because it would consume too much energy. Or the idea of having cycles within the economy that are more closed, that are not linear. I think that these are good ideas, but they always have to be connected with the idea of uh, reducing consumption. So con consumption and production cannot be magically turned into a circle. I think that uh, some people talk about circular economy and some of them, I read them and I do not agree, but others talk about this and I do agree. I think that we're on a similar wavelength and they understand that circular economy also needs to be an economy that is smaller and that is organized in a different way. So, so yes, I, I agree with certain things in that concept. And yes, Marie, could you briefly um, respond to this, circular economy? Alternatives, solutions, okay. Uh, there are the same risks as with those solutions that we were talking about previously when we think that we have a solution and we, and we expand it and put it all over the place and in the end it turns out, it, it turns out as a problem. It's just like with electric cars. A circular economy can be producing more to recycle more. It can be that as well. And even if we don't take into account uh, toxic, toxic products, yes, it can also be dangerous. It can be dangerous as well. So there is a circular economy that we mustn't accept and a circular economy that is good, that is very good. For instance, it has to do with social economy, for instance. It can be something good for society, but when the EU does things, it needs, and we all have to change this, with the help of, of development, when we have money, we want to finance activities and we choose the big companies, the big projects, and that also is a problem because what we need with circular economy, and more specifically, is to go to the smallest, the smallest companies, smallest associations, smallest bodies of social and solidarity, solidarity economy to help them develop a new economic model. Okay. I am being told that we're really sorry from the organization that there is a troll in the chat and they're trying to fix that. I think they've already fixed the problem, but they're apologizing for everything that this troll is doing, trying to ruin this debate. There are people who are very bored in their lives. But now let's go to another interesting question, which comes from Carmen Molina. She asks how we can reach climate neutrality in 2040 
without communicating this in the right way to the citizenship so that it's not just a political decision so that it is also um, done in a way that convinces the whole population. Yes, very good question. Yes, I think it's a very good question because I've been asking myself this question and asking this question to political leaders for 15, 20 years and the answer is always the same. So now that Marie is there and she's a very a person who's very much aware, I'm going to ask her that question so that she can try and move it around the European Parliament because what I think is that the time has come, as Churchill said, and he's not my favorite person to quote, but he said that the, ta the time of procrastination has uh, ended and now we're in the period of consequences. So we have to tell people clearly, for instance, I'm going to talk about my country, Spain, a very specific case, tourism. Tourism gives work uh, jobs to 2.5 million workers and it represents 15-30% of our GDP. But 35-38% of Canary Islands GDP and the Balearic Islands, uh, and we have to tell two people from the Canary Islands and the Balearic Islands that these parties are, are over. Even if we lose our, our positions are as MPs, they have to start looking for another way of, of making ends meet. Because people who, uh, who travel for, for six hours to spend a week in a jacuzzi in a low-cost hotel so that they can then go back to their countries with their, with their little all-inclusive bracelet is a system that is broken and it's not coming back. And not because of the COVID, but because the model is ended. And we have to tell that to the citizenship. And when I talk about tourism in our country that represents 15% of our GDP, I could talk about cars as well. We have to talk to big trade unions and tell them that they have to tell their workers that this model is over, that it is over having a car that weighs 2,000 kilos, whether it's electric or not, to, to uh, transport a person who can walk and, and transport him or herself. We have to change our city model. Marie was talking about a real problem. Cities are such big monsters that it's impossible to live in them. And we have to tell citizens from big cities to leave big cities as soon as possible in an orderly manner because that cannot be maintained. And I've talked quite a lot. So now for the rest to speak. Uh, there is another question that is very much linked to that. I'm going to ask it because it's the same person who asked that question, Carmen Molina. And I think it's a very interesting question because she, she talks about degrowth and she says... How can we also put a limit to a demographic growth? Because this is a topic that has never been touched upon because it's too delicate a matter, but I think it's crucial. So, Georgios, since you haven't touched, uh, you haven't intervened, this question is for you. I think that in European countries and in Spain we have to put a limit to the idea that we have to increase population because the population is already... It, I think the population is reducing itself. I think that the trend in the Spanish population is of degrowth in most European countries. I think it, that's the same, it's the same trend to degrowth. I am not the right person to say what others need to do, uh, especially people in contexts that I do not know of. And the population discourse sometimes can be very problematic because we we avoid thinking about our responsibility as consumers but also as producers and as political systems that are exploiting uh, the rest of the world and and obviously i think that this this is in the end a problem and we think that it is a problem of the poor people who have lots of kids and they have lots of kids because of the same uh, reason we had lots of kids because in the economy where they live to survive you need more kids you need more children so how can you escape that trap that that vicious circle, well, we know that we need to strengthen the rights of women so that they can control their bodies, so that they can decide how many children they have and when, and to establish systems, well-being um, systems and where people um, have their survival ensured without having to have an extended family. So these are factors that have worked. We have seen that they work, that they have worked in European countries and the population is not increasing. I don't want to, to be boring, but I think that the capitalistic um, system and growth system 
needs for population to grow. So now we are starting to see uh, that discourse that Spain is going to have problems, who is going to pay for the pensions, we need to, to increase our population and so on. And I know of progressive people in the US who are also very much worried for climate change. And for instance, a journalist who is very well known who says, Uh, a, bil a billion people are needed in the U.S. They think that that is the, uh, the best vision. So doubling the population of the U.S. And that is now also seeing a flat line. It is increasing due to immigration, but they want to stop immigration. So this is a progressive um, argument. So increasing population to double the population. So we have to fight against this. We, and also we have to strengthen The, the rights of, of people so that people can, can choose how to plan their families and systems, well-being systems that will ensure the livelihood of those families. And these are things that can control um, that, that idea of population. George Juan Bordela asks you when your book will be published in Spanish. I hope that soon, I hope that soon but I don't know when. I hope that it'll be published in January, February, but it depends on the publishing house. And now for everyone, what do you think about the fact that, according to the IPCC, we depend on, on all the technologies to capture CO2 and nuclear energy as well, because some members of the IPCC also talk about this energy. So, mainly um, CO2 capture. So, Do you think that it is still a problem to trust in technology and progress, Marie? Yes. Yes, obviously, it's a, it's a problem. It's a problem. And, and these technologies are not working currently. So it's just a dream. It's the dream of growth, the dream of constant progress. And it's not possible. It's not possible that we human beings who are supposedly serious, believed in those technologies and we thought that they would save us and would save the ecosystem. But I also wanted to go back to what Pedro was saying previously because I don't know if you have the same situation in Spain and I don't know if we have the same system in all over Europe because in France we have studies that show that if everyone Were to, were to use all of, all, all, all of their tools to save the climate, but we were to do it at our own level, we were, doing, uh, we were to do it at our own level, it would only help to reduce emissions for the country down to 25%. That's the reason why we need to change the system, because it's the system, it's transportation, it's a megalopolis, which make us consume so much. If all of us were to do everything that we can, it would not save the, the, country, the planet, it would not save biodiversity, it would not save uh, the climate, and it would not and would not allow us to respect the planet's limits. And it's very important, it's very important we need to understand that that is the reason why we have to act against lobbies. Lobbies that have all their doors open and we have to fight so that we can, uh, so that we can uh, point our finger at crimes against the environment and ecocides and all of the things that are happening. We have to stop this because this is, it's the system that needs to be changed and it is urgent. Yes, but with regards to this, these technologies, in the case of carbon capture, for instance, it is a technology that is not very mature, but with regards to nuclear energy, what's your vision? It's problematic, nuclear, um, TCS and hydrogen, and obviously natural gas, as I've already told you, are are usually proposed as solutions by, by the industries, by the companies that produce these energies. They say, we have to save the climate, so we have to develop our energies. And that is quite problematic because many of those energies, such as hydrogen, 
green hydrogen are, are good, but others are very, very dangerous. And for instance, nuclear energy, we don't know how how to deal with waste, with nuclear waste. It is very, very, um, very dangerous. And then we have uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima. That's very dangerous. And I come, from a con I come from a country where we have developed nuclear energy all over the place. And we didn't know. And we don't know how to build new nuclear uh, nuclear stations. We are we are actually no longer knowledgeable with regards to nuclear, and it is very very expensive. With the money that nuclear energy requires, we could we could have 100% renewable energy for by 2040 in the EU. We could do it, but we have to get out of nuclear energy, get our money out of nuclear energy to invest on renewable energies, really renewable energies. But the uh, nuclear uh, lobbies are very strong right now because, because of uh, climate poli policies. And sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. It depends on the week in the European Parliament to try and abolish uh, uh, to try to avoid for them to get money from the EU and uh, climate policies. Going back to degrowth, Oscar Vallol was saying, how can we make the idea of degrowth compatible or sustainable growth? Well, we said it's not synonyms and aspire to the fourth revolution. In this case, I think he's referring to the digital revolution. How can we combine degrowth and digitalization, which seems to, to be uh, the... the the, the magical solution to get out the, of the pandemic. Yes, Pedro, go ahead. I come from the telco world, so I think that we should end with the myth of the digital world. The digital world, not right now, the I, ICTs, information and communication technologies, are consuming up to 8-9% of the world's energy, so they're not free. They're what we thought. We thought that digi by digitizing we were going to ask for a kilo of uh, potatoes and it would get to our home without consuming energy. Well, that's not true. So we make our digital order, but in the end a person uh, driving his car that consumes energy will get to our home. And this is a voracious system. The biggest internet servers and the biggest communication centers are consuming energy in, a, in an exponentially um, growing way. And they're starting to put in danger the stability of our energy grids if we follow this trend. I think that the internet is also another ephemeral victories of our industrial society and technological society. And I'm really sorry because I've been promoting telcos for 30 years in my life. But as I see it nowadays, I think it's not neutral. It's not neutral. It could help in many cases. And as a matter of fact, we, I'm sure that we have managed to save many trips thanks to this conference and thanks to remote teleworking, people are, are consuming less. But I read a report, a French report, uh, the Sheik project, that talked about the fact that pornography consumes as much energy as Greece, as the whole country of Greece. That is uh, enormous. We should stop that somehow because that makes no sense. That consumption makes no sense. Internet, open, free internet. An academical internet would be great, but why do we need 5G and bandwidth? Well, that would be a different debate. That would be a different debate, yes. Okay, Marie, you, I, I think you, you've been raising your hand, so try and be brief in your intervention. Yes, I just wanted to come to to say that I, I agree with everything that Pedro has just said, but, but I ask you to pay attention because the European Commission is talking about the two transitions. There's the ecological transition and the digital transition, but there is one that is vital and the other that could be very dangerous. And that, that is a real political danger, putting both at the same level, and we shouldn't accept that. Okay, thank you. I don't know if George just wanted to say something, and if not, I will um, just continue with the next question. Pilar and Carmen have a series of uh, similar questions, and, and now they're just taking us down to the streets. What would you tell a person who is not 
familiar with concepts such as decarbonizing the economy and how can that person, that normal citizen, have an influence so that we change this economic model we live in. And what Carmen says as well in this, in this case is that how are we going to work in practice for the system to change if lobbies who are interested in the system to last still have so much power? How, how, how can a, a normal citizen fight against this so that they can change this structure that seems unmovable, unchangeable? Pedro? Oh, Georgios, Georgios. Well, I would say that, well, to a person who is not uh, familiar with these concepts, I think that metaphors help, sometimes they work, and a metaphor that everyone understands, uh, understands is that we have a current crisis, the pandemic, where everyone is trying to mobilize, and, and there are lots of failures in the Western world, we don't have a, a country that has dealt with this crisis well. And this is even easier than climate change. So we understand that there is a crisis that is affecting us all and we have to change the way in which we work and and we have changed the way we live and maybe in a way that is not good for many of us, but we have to change on a daily basis. I'm not against technology. Those of us who, who uh, well, in, in a pandemic we need a vaccine. Well, with climate change we need renewable energies and we have to combine these two things. The way in which we live, we have to change the way in which we live and we have to change the way in which we produce energy in the context of climate change. And the good news is that for climate change, we don't have to have any social distancing. We don't need to stop going to school or stop going to bars or to stop kissing each other. We can do all of those things without limits. We can do that without limits. We have to limit other things. We have to limit trips, unnecessary trips. We have to limit uh, unnecessary consumption, etc., etc. So I think that... Uh, I think that now uh, people in the streets understand this because we are all starting to understand that what happens nowadays is quite dramatic, but it's not as dramatic as the pandemic. And what will happen in 10 years? It's not that far away with climate change. Everyone can see the fires. Everyone can see the droughts. Uh, it's not that far away from people, but it's true that... There are people who are desperate, and when people are desperate, what will happen in 10 years will, will, be, will be quite serious. So it's not that people who are desperate won't want to change the system, but people who are desperate need solutions that work right now. And in that context, I am, I am for proposals that could now make a difference. So we have to invest in renewable energies and solidary economy to create jobs and at the same time to change to change the economy and do it in a way that works. And lobbies, not only lobbies, but also crazy people. We see that there are lots of crazy people. People who deny that there is a pandemic or that there are dead people. And unfortunately, there are not just a few crazy people. And with climate change, we'll have even more uh, crazy people. This is something that is currently happening, but they can't deny it. It could happen and they will just deny it. Well, we, those people have to fight. We have to convince those who, who can be convinced. And those who are crazy will see the way of uh, taking them out of the game and always keep on working because there will always be people who will not be convinced. Thank you, Georgios. And to end, I would like to to briefly summarize what has happened, but basically what interests us all and what we want is to find a balance, to find a balance between social well-being and the environmental well-being as well. And as for climate negationists, I hope it were only people in the streets. We also have a um, people in government at the other side of the ocean who are also working in a very powerful way against the climate, even more power, in a more powerful way than lobbies. So thank you so much. Thank you, Giorgio. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Marie.
Uh, I think it was a very interesting debate. All of you from your different angles, your different background have been very interesting. There have been lots of questions. People were very interested. So I wanted to thank La Casa Encendida, the European Grand Foundation and the, Europe and the Foundation Transición Verde. Thank you for inviting me to moderate this forum. I've learned a lot and I wanted to remind you all of you who are listening to us, that on October 22nd, this series of debates will continue. We will have another debate. We will be talking about the present and future of the agri-food system, and it will be at the same time as today, at half past six. So I invite you to connect once again, because I'm sure that it will be as, at least as interesting as today's debate. And with that, I say goodbye to you, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.